Hi there, I'm Stephen Lewis Simpson. I'm the filmmaker behind the film Neither Wolf Nor Dog, and I'm here today to dispel some myths about theatrical distribution and to basically explain to you how I made a film with a crew of two in approximately 125 filming hours with a star who was 95 years old, shooting in a very remote part of the United States, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and without touching the film industry in any other way going through the process, I've gotten the film onto so far about 120 theater screens uh, for full runs averaging two weeks in uh, probably around about 15% of the total US market and was still a long way to go. Um, and to put it in context, that's more theaters than the last two Palme d'Or winners at the Cannes Film Festival. So anyway, I just want to give you a little bit of background. I'll start from the beginning with this project. Uh, I was approached in 2009 uh, at a theater in uh, a town called Rushville, Nebraska by a author of a novel called Neither Wolf Nor Dog, which had been a best-selling uh, novel in a Native American theme, and he had just seen a film called Resbomb that I had shot, and I sh was showing it at a theater in the area. And he was intrigued uh, because here was somebody who actually got films made. He had been basically being having his time wasted for about 15 years by Hollywood producers making him wild-eyed promises about what they were going to do with his movie and the millions of dollars it was going to be made for and so on. And he'd had enough and he gave me the novel and he thought, well, let's see what this guy can do. And a while later I approached him, uh, having read it, and said, okay, let's go ahead and do this. And I made a, a promise to him that I get it made by all means necessary. And initially I tried the industry ways, uh, we raised some money and then the money fell through, wasted about a year of our time, the usual sorts of things. And in the meantime, I had met this uh, gentleman, Dave Bald Eagle, for the, this lead role of an elder that was, was central to the whole piece. And he was 93 at the time that we, we, we met. And so from then on, it became a race against time to get the film made because he was the perfect actor for it. No one else could have come close. And, but even from that point, and as I say, we, we wasted money trying to raise money in a more conventional way. And so I gave up on the industry at a certain point and uh, turned to fans of previous films of mine and fans in particular of the novel. We had a successful Kickstarter for about $25,000 and I put money aside for myself, the money of mine, and invested it in uh, a lot of equipment and other physical elements needed for the film. Um, that at the end of the production I sold the camera which was a red one and I sold uh, some vehicles and various other things, other pieces of equipment, Steadicam and all these sorts of things and made a net profit on all the equipment so there was not even a, a zero uh, equipment budget on this but I actually made money out of it uh, which is even you know better than blagging them for free and um, we had a, a very uh, fascinating shoot we uh, we shot incredibly quickly. It was over 18 production days, but on average seven hour days, eight hour days, because you know we had a 95 year old star. Um, two years had gone past since uh, I first met with him, and uh, you know we we essentially needed to fit around his energy. Um, we could have shot a lot faster if if um, you know also you know we just didn't have that factor. So the fact that combined it was about 125 hours shoot. And the film is an hour 50, it'll give you an idea of the fair clip that we were moving at. Um, I had one sound recordist and uh, basically whoever else was around lending a hand, typically uh, one other person, somebody, nobody, or even a couple of film uh, scenes where it was myself and one of the actors and nobody else was there. Uh, and then after that I again was looking at it quite sort of optimistically. I knew we had a very special film on our hands and I put it out into the festival route. And that ate into an incredible amount of time. You know, we had some glorious near misses. Um, the first person I screened it for personally was the head of the Venice Film Festival, who was very, uh, very impressed by the film and was very supportive and moved by it. But as you can imagine, Venice, you know, they take two or three American films and they're generally real heavy hitters. But then after that, it was just a uh, a long process of, of waiting to find something and line something up. And one thing that was in interesting was particularly using Vimeo, uh, where you can actually see the views, it was incredible how many film festivals never even watched the film. And 
you know, that was at a certain point where I just thought, no, nah, I, I, I'm not going to waste time with this any longer. And um, so I decided, you know, and I did the usual things. I got someone at CAA interested in looking at it. I got, uh, you know, uh, some of the other most prominent in, uh, companies out there that, that uh, you know, do film, uh, that sort of uh, representation of film at the end, um, a particular one out of New York that will remain nameless. And again, same thing very interested, love to see it, and then they never watched it. And there's a certain point where you just move on. So the film premiered at the Edinburgh Film Festival, and then a few months later I decided I was going into theaters direct. Now this is the unique and interesting part of it all. There are obviously a lot of films out there that are made on micro budgets to varying degrees of success. Most are unwatchable, but occasionally you get one which is an absolute gem and um, you know, hopefully get some form of recognition. But one of the things I looked at, I looked particularly at IFC, the, the independent film distributor that are very prominent. I've seen them in panels at Cannes and various other festivals talking about the whole mechanism. And then I looked at their performance and it was something like 20% of the releases they did gross less than $10,000 at the US box office, including one uh, of a friend of mine that a friend had directed with uh, a couple of well-known stars in it that performed less than that. And you just go, well, what's the point? And so I thought, well, you know, I know exactly where a bit of my audience is, and so I'll give it a shot. And in January 2017, I uh, opened it in a tiny theater on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation because my priority always is to do the opposite of what everyone else does when they film in Indian country, which is, you know, film there and then never be heard of again. Uh, well, there's a handful of rare exceptions to that. So I always show my work there first and we had to run in the theater there. And then uh, we slowly started to pick up one or two uh, theaters showing interest. Uh, and then at the end of February, we had our first sort of opening weekend, if you like, in four theaters. And I decided to do the complete opposite of what the main distributors do. The main distributors open in New York, uh, Chicago, LA, and maybe one or two other places. And then if they get some good reviews, they maybe roll it out a little further, or it might just die a death there. Now, that seems silly to me if your audience is elsewhere. And so I decided to be a big fish in a small pond rather than a minnow in an ocean and earmarked a number of theaters. So with our four opening theaters, we had Bemidji, Minnesota, which was in a 10 screen, highly commercial multiplex, uh, a similar type of theater in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, a small uh, two screen theater in Eagle Butte, South Dakota, and uh, a one screen a cultural center theater on uh, the Yakima Indian Nation, uh, Taubanish, Washington. Now, with the exception of Rochester, where I just went because I'd had people leaning out to me and, and showing interest, Bemidji is where the author had been based through the whole writing and many years after the novel and was based uh, with the character, he, he, the, the central character, one of the central characters is based on him, and so the story even starts there. And so I knew that that's where the novel was best known. Eagle Butte is on the reservation where Dave Bald Eagle grew up. And uh, Yakima Nation, uh, strangely enough, is where my white lead was born. The only white guy I've ever heard of to be born on a, a, an Indian reservation in an Indian Health Service hospital. Pure coincidence, by the way. Um, and so I knew that in all of those markets there was interest. And so we ended up with a strong screen average. But in uh, Bemidji, we did fantastically well. We had. Um, it was, you know, over 1,100 admissions in our first week. We were the number one film. We beat the seven, uh, sorry, the nine uh, Hollywood films that were in there uh, against us. And uh, suddenly, one or two other theaters in the area started paying attention. But it took time. Um, you know, some bookers looked at it and saw it was just thought it was just a fluke in those areas. And there was a bit of time slowly building, uh, creating the building blocks, figuring out the process, figuring out. Um, you know, how best to manufacture and deliver the DCPs, how to create the VPF deals, how to uh, have the best media approach. One thing that was proven right from the beginning was that by being in these small markets, we immediately got great media attention in all the, the, the local newspapers. And I tell you this, this is one of the key things in my entire strategy. If you're in a small town, or uh, uh, anything up to a mid-sized city, that local newspaper there 
uh, is like gold because it passes through so many people's hands within that day. And they don't get national film stories generally. They don't get access to filmmakers or, or actors or that sort of thing. So by us going in there and truly offering them access, it always provided an opportunity. And you could see it sometimes in the figures staggeringly clearly. We had one, for example, in a theater where they only published uh, once a week. And for all my uh, messages for the editor of that, th that paper, it took days for him to get back to me. And by the time he did, he, was, he just fell in love with the story, but unfortunately their issue came out on the Wednesday after our opening on the Friday. So uh, that weekend we didn't do very well. It was a multiplex in a small town, you know, our classic sort of demographic. But Wednesday and Thursday the figures went absolutely through the roof and it was because people knew it was on. They'd read it, they'd, they'd either had been aware of the novel but didn't know it was on and that joined the dots for them or they were so intrigued by the story, which is the sort of key driver of it. And that really pushed us uh, through the, the roof with that. And then the theater uh, bookers got back to us and obviously on the Monday, having not performed over the, the weekend so well, um, it, it was determined to be off that week because obviously Monday is the day where they decide whether you're held for a second week or not. And they got back to us and said, if only we had known, they would have held us. And that was sort of an, the clearest example I've had of you know, just doing everything possible to get that article in the paper before we get started. And as we built a reputation in the area, I finally managed to get into a major theater, which was the Landmark Lagoon in Minneapolis, which was our holy grail. I knew that that was going to be our biggest market of any, uh, certainly at that point. And something remarkable happened. We were getting the managing, um, the manager of the theater reaching out to us and telling us things like, uh, no film had sold out its opening night since uh, Star Wars, for example. And at the end of that first week, uh, we had the publicist of the chain reach out to us and say um, that we had more admissions that week than the film with the top screen average in the entire United States that week, which was another film of theirs that was in one theater in New York, building up its uh, rollout. Um, they beat us with the uh, box office because they had a far higher ticket price. And then that started opening more and more and more doors for us uh, from there because people started taking us a bit more seriously. But even then it was harder than you would have thought. Um, people sort of would pigeonhole you within certain markets. So I took advantage of that. We were doing well in Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and so I moved us into Montana, into the Northwest. We've now played 23 or got, got a few more coming in, but 23 theaters in Washington State alone, 19 in Oregon, um, three so far in Montana with a bundle more to come. Um, blockbusters are films that are playing more than that in those regions, but pretty much any film from Fox Searchlight, Sony Pictures really isn't getting there. We even found ourselves in the height of blockbuster season, uh, places like uh, you know Harkins Theater in Tempe, Arizona, where we are next to Spider-Man, Pirates of the Caribbean, Despicable Me, Wonder Woman, all these kinds of movies in a small theater in Vancouver, Washington. We beat 11 out of the 12 blockbusters playing down the road. Only Wonder Woman beat us. It had had 35 shows that week and we had had six. And that was all down to the film having had the most remarkable article in the local paper and also people traveling a far way to see it. They were the first theater in the area showing it. So people from Portland and other parts of Oregon drove there to see it. But as I say, we built up 19 more theaters in the region with others to come just within Oregon. And so it is that thing about the big fish in a small pond. It, it keeps working its way through. It's a very true part of film distribution. It's being taken seriously by proving through that meritocracy that theaters have that the rest of the industry doesn't have of where is your audience to prove it for us. And that's been the best part of it. None of them ever ask who's in the film. None of them ever ask um, what awards is it won or whatever else. They go, okay, down the road you did this you know, number of admissions, that's good enough for us. But the problem is in the rest of the country, they don't really pay attention to that. They see it as a local thing. And theaters aren't designed to be reached. There's a it's very well established mechanism between distributors and buyers uh, slash bookers or as intermediaries um, handling it for the theaters. And so what we often do is we go direct into the theaters, build their interest, they know their audience best, and then have them go to their uh, buyers and 
uh, have them just uh, sort out the information with us or often they'll just do it direct with us. And so it's, it's all been about the theatres and the relationship with the theatres. The, uh, the building of the campaigns we do in each market, there's a tremendous amount of outreach. For example, um, native schools, for example, in some areas. We had one in Oregon where we had 325 school kids through their door in one day. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of films that won't even get that in an, in an entire week. That's a you know, pretty solid number of admissions. And so that, you know, it's something where we spend almost nothing on marketing. We, we spend money on Facebook ads to make sure that our particular demographic um, understands that we're there. But when there's two or three occasions I've taken out ads in main weeklies in, you know, Oklahoma City and we did one in Seattle and the numbers were no better than they are in other, were in other places. So I just found that sort of conventional advertising wasn't advantageous, but great media coverage was. And so that's been our entire focus. And, you know, the irony having made a film with such a tiny crew and it was just myself in pre-production all the way through to uh, the first few months in theaters. Um, but since then I've built a team, you know, slowly to begin with, um, but now I've got a number of people working with me and we're progressing into Europe next. Um, we're working on releasing in the UK, Sweden, um, a bunch of other countries going, you know, big, medium, small markets, big, medium, small markets in cycles. And um, having a team to be very, very hands-on with that. I've also been in eight theatres in Canada so far. And so it's the first time I've known, I've heard of any way of a, a filmmaker releasing in multiple countries themselves. And so I was trying to create this whole new business model where I never have to go to the industry for making um, films of a certain level. And uh, it's been very liberating. You know, nine months of the process was 100 plus hours a week working. Um, it was a miserable time really, but at the end of the day, it's a miserable time raising money. And that can take years. And by taking this process in house, I know I no longer have to do that. And so the key for it is, you know, are you prepared to put in the incredible amount of work. If you have a team of people uh, at your disposal, then great, but you're gonna have to learn it all from the ground up. Um, you know, finding out who the buyers are, finding out who the theater uh, owners are, who, who makes the decisions, and just the sheer uh, persistence it takes to reach out to them. So you have to bear that in mind. It will only work with certain films. But I came back to a point that I made at the beginning, I'm coming back to it, which is, uh, I was sort of talking about IFC, uh, the film distributor that are very well established. Last year they released 26 feature films and we outperformed 23 of them and I'd never done this before. My film was smaller than any of the other ones they had released. Uh, Kochlober, who are uh, another very well established independent film distributor, released 32 last year. We've outperformed them all and as I say we've been in more theaters than both the last two Cannes Film Festival winners and we've barely left 15, 20% of the market so far. We've got a long way to go. I'm gonna keep running in theaters um, until we run out of steam and then turn to video on demand. Everyone concentrates on the video on demand market these days, but what's the point if you can't establish your film? If nobody knows it exists, if uh, there's no word of mouth on it, then you're just sitting on a platform and, and nobody cares. Um, People are hearing about this film and it's building ahead of steam. The theatrical is being very profitable. Uh, the margins are good, um, which it wouldn't be if we were doing through a conventional distributor. They would be pouring money out the door. There was an established distributor that released another native film this year that was far, far better financed than ours, an experienced distributor. And uh, in their biggest release on release, they were in 45 theaters, mostly AMCs and that sort of thing. And in that 40, with those 45 theaters, they gross roughly the same as we did in our four weeks in one theater in Minneapolis. But it's because we knew where our audience was, we knew how to reach them, and we put in the groundwork. So you have to be realistic about what the industry will achieve. And uh, you have to look at it and see, well, can you do the same? But it's all about, is, will the audience fight for your film? Um, I don't care. Uh, about pretty much anything else in this matter. I've released a bunch of films, uh, or I've made a bunch of films before, but none of them I could have released this way. So you have to be very realistic. That is the key. And, um, and do your homework. And, um, you know, the key as well from there on is when you look at the market, you also have to see, who, do I have a key element 
that I can get into. And location-wise, we've played in um, you know, 10 or 11 multiplexes that have been owned by native tribes, for example. So we've known that we've, we've had a, a good base audience around there. It's always good to identify a base audience. Um, but, you know, and as I say, we've managed to tap into the educational through that a fair bit. But also we have an older audience. Uh, our film is also a destination film for, for those people that want to see it. So we can land pretty much any time of the year in a theater and we will do well. We're great counter-programming to other films. So knowing these factors are pretty important. And, um, you know, just being really realistic about the amount of work that, that, that can be done. I think, I think uh, for the most of you out there, it would be actually a waste of time to do. And you have to be truly, uh, you know, prepared to uh, be honest about that. Or just basically the first thing to go in is look at the part of the country where you will have the most impact. And uh, re you have to write your own model for every film. I think that goes for every aspect of a film, from the production to er everything down. It should all be based to serve your story, your narrative, your audience the best way possible. And we live in an industry where they do typically things the same way, which makes no sense whatsoever. So, you know, be your own person about that. Be as much of an artist with the release as you would be in the putting it together. But as we know from putting films together, uh, the art takes up a tiny amount of the process. The majority of it is just extreme hard work, especially when you've not got much of a budget. So anyway, that's my story. Good luck to you all and um, best wishes.